Well, good evening, everybody. It's a great, it's a great event in the life of the university to have guests on campus to celebrate uh, professorial lectures. It's an important event, and we use the university senate room, which is also our, one of our chapels, uh, for the purpose, and it's kept only for special occasions outside senate meetings. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first in our spring series of inaugural lectures. Now, you won't believe this, but it is the spring series, and it's the first of them. Inaugural, prof inaugural professorial lectures gives us all a chance to hear what our senior colleagues seek to profess at this university. It is always good to see colleagues from across the disciplines and the subjects uh, pitching up to these because um, they are interested in what our new professors are, are, are saying and wish to say here at this university. Now, it is, that is, in my view, the nature of intellectual curiosity where scientists, our new professor of science, um, and others, as I look around, coming here to listen to our new uh, visiting professor in media and communication speak. The university makes much of its professors because we seek from them academic leadership. It's these professors who help map out new terrain in their disciplines and their fields of study and fields of practice. This university has been building up over the years an excellent team of academics from all over the world. At last count, we had scholars from 35 nationalities on our staff, 18 nationalities among our students, and that's the seriously international campus. However, tonight's lecturer is one of us here in Liverpool, the well-known radio journalist Roger Phillips. A Cambridge graduate, Roger has over some 30 odd years made Liverpool his home. His lasting contribution to this region has been acknowledged by the other two universities in Liverpool. Liverpool John Moores gave him an honorary fellowship and the University of Liverpool conferred on him an honorary doctorate in recognition of Roger's contribution. And as I said, Roger Phillips is visiting professor at this university in the Department of Media and Communications. And like screenwriter and author, and equally well-known Frank Cottrell Boyce, who is also a professor here, we are delighted to bring leading practitioners alongside the permanent research course staff of the university. Why do we do this? We do this to expose departments and especially our future graduates to the dynamism of creative practice and to the, and to the dy dynamism of professions. It is one thing to study textbooks and articles on the process of effective communication. It's quite another experience to have a well-known seasoned radio journalist working with you on editing and presenting a piece of work. It's in that interaction one gets and acquires balance and insight, acquires judgment and nuance. For me, these are the marks of a, serious, a seriously good in education. Next year, we introduce a new major at the university in creative writing. And again, alongside scholars of language and literature, we will have well-known novelists and poets and others to bring color and depth through the program. Now here's a bit of interesting hot news, not 24 hours old. Dr. Marilyn Robinson, the well-known author of Housekeeping in 1980, Gilead in 2004, and Home in 2008. Housekeeping was a finalist for in 1980, 1982 for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in the US. Gilead was awarded that prize in 2005 and Home received the 2009 Orange Prize for Fiction here in the UK. And Madeline Robinson will be getting an honorary doctorate here at this university next July. And a very well-known TV journalist will probably be getting an honorary doctorate here uh, this July. So we are bringing together serious practitioners alongside our top researching staff. 
Visiting uh, Professor Roger Phillips, I notice takes students to heart, and his presence in the department will be a great asset in the formation of a distinctive HOPE graduate. I've seen him in action, and I discovered quite another side to this fellow deputy lift, lieutenant uh, who I've got to know over the years. I should go back and, and warmly welcome you all, and especially Lord Mayor. It's lovely to see you here, Lord Mayor, and to see the Pro-Chancellor, to see Regents and members of Council with us, and other guests and friends. A special welcome to Roger's family, Margaret, who I know and have, we, we have met in several times, and daughters Eleanor and Alexandra, and their husbands are with us today, and so are several of Roger's friends. You are very welcome. Uh, we're very glad to have you with us. Uh, Sue Owen, the managing editor of the BBC, Merseyside, unfortunately is ill tonight, but Mrs. Pauline McAdam is here, the assistant editor. Um, I guess you're very welcome, um, Pauline. And it's lovely to see our old friend and her husband, Angela Hislop, with us. Angela, I did see you come in. They're right at the back. It was Roger's editor, I guess, as well. Very good to have you all from the BBC with us and other friends. Ladies and gentlemen, with, without any delay, let me introduce now Professor Kenneth Newport, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and, uh, amongst other things, he does here. And Professor Newport will introduce our speaker formally. Colleagues and friends and distinguished guests, it is a great honor indeed and a privilege to introduce to you this evening the first of our inaugural lecturers for 2014. As the university moves forward, the place of all of our professors here at HOPE cannot be overstated. And it's a particular delight that among those who take up these senior posts at the university are highly accomplished visiting professors who bring in service of our corporate mission and ambition, a range of professional experience as well as academic achievement. Our curriculum is enriched thereby, our students are better formed, and the university's vision is widened. Roger Phillips was born in Manchester and studied at the University of Cambridge. And while there, according to his own account, he spent most of his time acting in drama groups, including the Marlowe Society and the Footlights. He eventually became a professional actor, which brought him to Liverpool and the Everyman Theatre in the early 70s, and he's lived here ever since. Although now best known on Merseyside as a radio presenter, Professor Phillips has had a variety of jobs, including that of a Liverpool hackney cab driver. But it was to acting that most of his earlier time in Liverpool was devoted and among his many acclaimed roles, Roger Phillips performed with, with Peter, Peter Postlethwaite in Shaw's Widower's Houses, and he was in the company that created and performed the final production put on by The Everyman before it was redeveloped, a production with the wonderful title of Hoolis Hope Street, Hope Street Wake. During the redevelopment of The Everyman, Professor Phillips toured with the company performing in a variety of plays, including Chris Bond's production of Macbeth, starring Bernard Hill, in which he, Roger that is, unforgettably played one of the witches. And the acting career continued in the late 70s and early 80s with many appearances, mainly in Liverpool, but also in London. Since 1981, however, it was Professor Phillips's broadcasting work that came most impressively to the fore. And it is in this context, as well as in his work in the theatre, for his work in the theatre, that he received such wide recognition. He's the winner and recipient of many prizes and awards, too many to mention here, but among them are the following, and this isn't an exhaustive list. A Sony Award for the best phone-in presenter, being voted National Union of Journalists Broadcaster of the Year, twice being named as the BT Regional Broadcaster of the Year, and also BT's National Broadcaster of the Year. He was twice named Broadcaster of the Year at the Scousology Awards, and once at the Merseyside Arts Awards. And in 2011, 
he was awarded the Radio Academy Lifetime Achievement Award, a distinguished collection of awards indeed. In 2000, Professor Phillips had the enormous success of beating Radio 4's John Humphreys and Peter White and the Woman's Hour team, as well as Radio 5 Live's Andrew Neal, when he was named Sony Speech and Talk Broadcaster of the Year. And, I'm reliably informed, he has the best legs in Liverpool. Or at least, that's what one reviewer wrote when Roger returned to the stage to play one of the Ugly Sisters in Cinderella at the Neptune Theatre in 2000. As we've heard, Professor Phillips is a honorary, an honorary Doctor of Laws at the University of Liverpool and an honorary fellow of the Liverpool John Moores University and Deputy Lieutenant of Merseyside. And so it is a great pleasure then to be here this evening to mark the addition of one further well-deserved recognition of achievement as Professor Phillips takes up the post of visiting professor in broadcast journalism here at this university. In which role, rather than one as one of the many colourful characters he's played, alas, I now have the pleasure to invite him to deliver to us his inaugural lecture on the topic, the BBC, the good, the bad and the ugly. Vice-Chancellor, Lord Mayor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I assume that it's customary on these occasions to thank the Vice-Chancellor for inviting me to give an inaugural speech. And while I am indeed very grateful to Professor Pillay for the honour of asking me to become uh, a visiting professor here at Hope University, I did not appreciate that it would include what I'm now embarking on in addressing you. You see, it's quite easy in the radio. You just have a microphone in front of you. You don't see people in the flesh so to speak, and uh, it can be quite nerve-wracking. There's a great story about a, a director general of the BBC, I don't know which one, who was very nervous in his first speech, a thing like this, but royalty was there, etc. And his PA had given him a list of all the people and what he had to say in the correct order to say it. So he went through it, your royal highness, blah, 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 got to the end of it. Distinguished yes, ladies and gentlemen, he was so relieved, he then said, on behalf of the British Broad Corp in castration. <laughs> Now, I hope not to make such mistakes tonight, although I do make them on the radio quite frequently. The worrying thing is I look at the list of the forthcoming inaugural speakers and they are simply out of my class, so I must apologise in advance for my lack of academic rigour. What you get from me is what I've observed over the past 30 years, working in one particular, and in my view, one of the best and most extraordinary parts of the BBC, local radio. The good, the bad, the ugly, that's just me at any given point in my programme. It is actually extraordinary to me that as creative, authentic and wayward a child as local radio should spring from a corporation where men, and it was just men, once wore or allegedly wore dinner jackets to intone the news. So here's what I intend to do during the next half hour or so. This is what we call in the industry the menu at the beginning of the programme. I hope to inform, educate, and if we're all lucky, a little bit of entertainment as well, about that proudly parochial and tribal part of public service broadcasting where I've applied my trade. So as it approaches its golden anniversary, I'd like to give you my perspective on how local radio, and in particular Radio Merseyside, fits into the BBC as a whole. BBC seems to operate in threes. Interestingly, many cultures throughout history, as most of you know, it's considered a sacred, indeed a mystical number the British Broadcasting Corporation uh, would be a bastion of public service broadcasting. And it would set out to inform, educate, and entertain. Undoubtedly, one of the most optimistic of all mission statements. Unfortunately, that's only two words, which may explain the reason that mission statements are really a bit of a waste of time. Almost half a century ago, the BBC began an ambition experiment, local radio, truly the vox popularis. And so the realisation began that the business of informing, educating and entertaining was a conversation, not a lecture. A truly interactive child was born of that original premise. The people not only had a voice, but a radio station through which they could and would be heard. Eventually, we, the broadcasters, began to understand that they, the people, were the custodians and the curators. 
and the issue arose of how to balance that democratization of the BBC with the BBC's responsibilities as gatekeeper. Vox Popularis, after all, translates as the voice of the people, not the voice of the mob. You only have to look at some of the unedifying exchanges on social media sites to see the difference. So how did this all come about? How in the 1960s, when four lads shook the world, one former war correspondent managed to shake the BBC into opening its studio doors to the people of Merseyside and beyond. It couldn't have happened any earlier than it did, certainly not under the leadership of the man who coined those three words that are at the core of the BBC at its best, inform, educate and entertain. He was, of course, a man after whom the Reith lectures are named, John Charles Walsham Reith, perhaps the most unlikely progenitor of the concept of public service broadcasting. He was given the job of being the first general manager of the British Broadcasting Company Limited, as it was then in 1922. Reith had no broadcasting experience at all when he applied for the job. But what he did have was strict Presbyterian religious convictions. And I believe that the importance of sticking to the principle of independence from government, from politics, from bias, in, in, in essence impartiality, arose out of that Scottish background. So in my view, it was a very good thing that in 1926, very early on, the BBC came into conflict with both the Conservative and the Conservative government and the Labour opposition of the day when it reported on all sides in the general strike, including the TUC and you did the big, big row, plus a change. But he was, of course, of his time when class divisions were absolute and the BBC clearly spoke for and to those at the top. And I do mean clearly received pronunciation, RP, which as late as 1974 was spoken, it's estimated, by only 3% of the population was de rigueur at the BBC. It was the voice of authority, the voice of I'm better than you. And it was mainly spoken in the south of England. The fact is that RP was the preserve of the aristocracy and expensive public schools, and so a very small social minority was favoured over the rest of the population. Strange, it was the war that began to change that when, to distinguish its own broadcasts from German propaganda, the BBC employed Yorkshire-born Wilfred Pickles as a newsreader. Better that than the clipped accents of Lord Haw. But so conditioned were many of the public, and indeed some of the BBC's staff to RP, that some people were apparently less inclined to believe the news when it came with a Yorkshire accent. It's still true today to some extent. Take the BBC Breakfast's business correspondent, Steph, Stephanie McGovern. She may have explained the global economic crisis to millions of viewers, but she said that her colleagues treat her as, and I quote, too common for telly because of her Teesside accent. One BBC manager told her, and I quote, I didn't realize people like you were clever. And I'm afraid she regularly gets abuse from her audience, again quoting her, I've had tweets questioning whether I really did go to university because surely I would have lost my accent if I did, a letter suggesting very politely that I get correction therapy, and an email saying I should get back, get back to my council estate and leave the serious work to the clever folk. Now if that's an attitude today in a 21st century of rolling news in a country which flirts with political devolution, how much more unlikely does the birth of local radio in the 1960s seem? And yet, here we are. Steph is a symptom of the BBC growing up, just as much as is Radio Merseyside. The truth is that the BBC is more or less of its time, sometimes ahead, sometimes behind. And as luck would have it, the BBC had the right Director General in place when British society was changing from the deference of post-war Britain in the 50s to the relative affluence and freedom of the 60s. The post-war director general, William Haley, believed in a hierarchical structure for the BBC's radio listeners with the third program, which he created at the top, followed by the home service, and then the light program in effect for the plebs, who he hoped would ascend that ladder of culture. Two DGs later comes along Sir Hugh Green, very different mind. He arrived at a difficult time when BBC television was facing serious competition from ITV. Interestingly, he was one of the few director generals to emerge from the ranks of the BBC itself. He started out as a journalist. 
He understood the changing mood and nature of society, and BBC television blossomed. It wasn't just comedies such as Till Death Has Do Part and Steptoe and Son. The gritty policemen in Z cars were light years away from the good, old, and completely unrealistic Dixon of Doc Green. Under his aegis came Monty Python's Flying Circus, the Foresight Saga, and programmes still running today, such as Horizon, Match of the Day, and Doctor Who. Most controversially of all, the BBC definitively turned its back on those old values of deference to power and authority. Rather, it challenged them, not least with the satirical programme TW3, That Was the Week That Was, after which the British establishment never regained its ascendancy. That programme was unique in lampooning those at the top and fearless in the subjects it dealt with, the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, the monarchy, Nobel Prize winners such as Watson and Crick, the class system, racism, they were all its targets. There has, in my view, been nothing like it since. The nearest that I can think of was Spitting Image on ITV, and currently Have I Got News For You, which is a teddy bear in comparison. TW3 was dangerous, which I imagine is why it was dropped for the 1964 general election and sadly never resurfaced. But under Sir Hugh Green, the BBC didn't just challenge the powers that be. It challenged the public too, with the socially aware Wednesday Play series, which include drama documentaries such as Up the Junction, featuring scenes of factory women, coarse language, and backstreet abortion, and Cathy Come Home, the latter the saga of a homeless young couple and their battle to prevent their children being taken into local authority care, directly led to the formation of that charity crisis still going today. Now, none of this was easy. Green had to fight many battles, at least one of which with the government he lost when the war game was withdrawn from broadcast in 1965 and had to wait 20 years to be shown. Under his tenure, we were offered outstanding documentary series such as Sir Kenneth Clarke's Civilization and The Great War, narrated by Sir Michael Redgrave. Sir Hugh Green, as you'll probably understand from what I've been saying, was, in my view, one of the greats of broadcasting. And from my perspective, on the outer reaches of the BBC and local radio in the 21st century, I look back on his tenure with gratitude because he encouraged and supported another great of broadcasting, Frank Gillard, the founder of BBC Local Radio. I personally, many, many other BBC people, and most importantly, millions of listeners, owe him an enormous debt. And I was privileged to be able to meet him and thank him at an event to celebrate 30 years of local radio a year before his death in 1998. Like Sir Hugh Green, Gillard was a broadcaster, a war correspondent, whom Green promoted to director of radio. Frank Gillard, like Green, was courageous. As pirate radio was fought off the air by the authorities, he saw the need for a pop radio station and he created and launched Radio One. At the same time, he renamed, to much controversy, the light programme as Radio 2, the third as Radio 3, and the home service as a holy speech station, Radio 4. And he took the opportunity to launch his vision of local radio. Frank Gillard believed that his experimental BBC local radio should be, quote, offering modern radio journalism geared to the interests of the local community. I suspect he'd read Raymond Williams' book, Britain in the 60s, Communication, which was published by Penguin in 1962 and offered this food for thought. The BBC has an excellent definition of public service broadcasting, but it exemplifies the dangers of the very large organisation in which producers can become subject to administrators. The development of regional and local broadcasting could become the means of transferring control of this public service broadcasting to the producers themselves. Even if Gillard had not been aware of Williams and that quote, he'd certainly visited America and Canada on several occasions in the 50s, where he saw in practice the benefits, the possibilities of local radio. Indeed, he was evangelical about it, and from what I can make out, approached the convincing of the BBC management and governors rather as if it was a war campaign. From the outset, Gillard ensured that, quote, managers would be free 
to provide the programmes which best met the needs of their communities. Even in 1979, Michael Barton, the then controller of BBC Local Radio, was able to write, despite my title, it would be wholly alien to the whole concept if I told each station what I thought was good for its audience. So each station had its distinctive style and sound. But to get there, there were many problems for Gillard to overcome, not least the issue of funding. Simply put, there was none. The idea was that for the eight pilot stations, which included Liverpool, the local authorities in each area would fork up the cash. Well, in the end, the BBC itself provided the setting up costs, and those local authorities, brave enough and rich enough, I suppose, to do so, funded the running costs, although they were not allowed specifically to raise the rates to do so. Of course, there was a massive conflict of interest. Just how objective could any station be towards its local authority if that authority was its paymaster? There were many other issues. Wavelength scarcity, the introduction of independent commercial radio, but an internal BBC document, uh, debate, sorry, culminated in a document called Broadcasting in the 70s. It was published by BBC Publications in 1969, and it concluded, there is a demand for local radio. We want to satisfy it over the country as a whole. It argued for an expansion of local radio to 40 stations. And that became possible in part because, fortuitously, audiences were switching to colour television. And that meant the licence fee money increased. The BBC had more money to play with. And so, to November 1967, 12.30pm, on the 22nd of that month, a relentlessly optimistic jingle, which you'll hear later, composed by Merseybeat legend Jerry Marsden, announced the arrival of BBC Radio Merseyside, the country's third and largest local radio station. We went live after a series of frankly bizarre holding broadcasts voiced by Ken Dodd to let people know that we were on our way in that part of the dial. You'll hear them. We began optimistically. Not for us the safety of the studio, no. We were out and about in the brave new world with an outside broadcast on day one, mind you, day one, outside broadcast on a Mersey ferry and under the sea in a Mersey tunnel. And we were off air in a matter of minutes due to a technical hitch. Please say, Sean, I'll try to remember that next time one of our newfangled smartphones and iPads and whatever we have now breaks down. And the weather played its part too. As local radio then, as it does now, and notably recently over the past few weeks, came into its own when the weather turned bad. Radio Leicester and Plaudits during the floods of July 1968, as did radios Brighton and Merseyside when heavy snow fell in December 1967 and February 1968, respectively. More and more examples emerged of how the stations were responding to the social and community needs of their localities, just what Gillard had envisaged. So, all turned out well. By the time I got involved with BBC and local radio in 1978, there was a genuine localness and independence. And that, in fact, is exemplified by the way in which I got a job at Radio Merseyside. I was an actor come taxi driver in Liverpool, where I arrived, as you've heard, in the early 70s to work at the Everyman Theatre. The four Northwest local radio stations had run a playwriting competition, and the winning play was to be broadcast professionally. My name had cropped up on the BBC's Northwest Actor Database, and I got asked to take part. We recorded it in the BBC's drama studios in Manchester, and as far as I was concerned, that was that. A couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from the man who directed the play, Reg Brooks, who happened to be a Radio Merseyside producer, and who, as I subsequently found out, had nurtured and went on to nurture many aspiring broadcasters, including Janice Long, now of BBC Radio 2, the comedian Tom O'Connor and the former MP Robert Kilroy Silk, surprisingly. Reggie explained they'd be looking for a new presenter for the morning show, which was then called Morning Merseyside. And having failed to come up with anyone suitable, they wondered, would I be interested? Now, I'm never one to say no. So I agreed to meet up with the news editor, Ian Judson, another great broadcaster in the tradition of the best of the BBC. So 5 p.m. the very next day, found me at the studios on the sixth floor of Commerce House in Sir Thomas Street. I knew nothing of broadcasting or journalism. I'd never even listened to Radio Merseyside. And yet, after chatting for a while, 
Ian suggested there and then, on the spot, that I read the six o'clock bulletin. He basically sat by me, handed me each story, I read it, and the bulletin went out. Next day, I met up with the manager, Rex Borden, and the program organizer, Roy Corlett. I was offered the job. Now, I suppose it sounds a bit ridiculous compared to the modern day formality of CVs, job applications, job descriptions, transparency, etc., etc., etc. But what it does show is that our, our local radio was truly independent. How much trust there was, and that's such an important word, how much trust there was in managers. More than that, I would argue that gut feeling, instinct, understanding your audience is what leads to idiosyncratic presenters, each with a unique style, such as Billy Butler, Sean Stiles and Tony Snell on Radio Merseyside, Alan Bezik on Radio Manchester, Frank Woppert in the North East, Red Doolan at Radio WM, all distinctive characters. The last thing they are is bland, and they are very much of their patch, despite Ed being Australian, and after all heresy of heresies, I'm a Mancunian. Back in 1978, when I started at Radio Merseyside, all the local radio station managers had virtual autonomy. We had our own marketing, local musicians created our own jingles, our letter headed, heading matched our branding. We were unique and distinctive. And managers decided on the schedules, although originally they only broadcast for four or five hours a day, the rest of the output being filled with Radio 2 or Radio 4. But gradually they filled more airtime and reinforced their own different, unique identities. Each station had an education producer, but each one of those went about their job in his or her own distinctive way, whether working with the Workers' Education Association for the local community, or with the local education authority for schools or whatever. All of that and much more was true as far as Radio Merseyside was concerned. The creativity was widespread and exciting. It, local academics, musicians, writers, directors, actors all got on board. We produced a highly professional drama series, The Merseysiders, and the first black soap opera in the country, The Grove, both funded by external partners. Alan Bleasdale began his writing career on BBC Radio Merseyside with a series of short stories about Scully. Roger McGough was part of the first day's broadcasts in 1967 with a scaffold, and 40 years later, he wrote a poem to mark our 40th birthday. That poem captures entirely the notion of local radio being of its place and not parachuted in. I'm just going to give you a part of it. I am the voice that announces you are not alone. I speak your language. I am homegrown. I am the gift of the gab. I am the quiet word. I am the night watch and the early bird. I am on your wavelength, on your side of the street. I am with you in triumph and in defeat. I am Hillsborough, Heisel, the European Cup, the phantom caller who won't hang up. I am the Phil, the everyman, the walker, the Tate. I am 1967 and 2008. I am your voice. I am your ear to the ground. I am the pool of life and the Mersey sound. I wonder if Frank Gillard had thought about the possibility that instead of imposing public service broadcasting on an area, the place might impose itself on the broadcaster, that the people would prove to be an irresistible force and the BBC would find that it was not, in fact, an immovable object. I suspect he did. Furthermore, in the good old days, blind eyes were turned where necessary. A striking example of that was when Ian Judson, who'd progressed from news editor to station manager at Radio Merseyside, realised that we could gain more listeners and hold them overnight for the following morning's breakfast programme if we stayed on air from 6 through until midnight rather than ending at 6pm as we did. He put the idea forward to that controller of local radio I mentioned earlier, Michael Barton, and after some debate at the Board of Management, the idea was knocked back, couldn't be afforded. I think, anyhow, if I remember rightly, that was the main reason. So, what did Ian do? He found the money. He went ahead regardless. And what happened? So successful was it that within a year or two, every local radio station was broadcasting until midnight. The sad fact is that that pioneering spirit, that independence, has been managed out of the BBC to a large extent. It's not the fault of the managers, all really good people, fighting what has until now been a losing battle, and I say until now, 
because I believe things are changing for the better as I've come to. It's the result of a centralising policy over what music we play, how much speech we should broadcast, what audience we should be broadcasting to, and so on. Whilst you probably realise I'm something of a conspiracy theorist about central power, I do understand the pull. We are, after all, the BBC. We cannot and should not be so maverick that we've become unrecognisable from the parent plant. The problem is that some of those in the centre just don't understand why we're the success we are. Decreeing that the two minutes armistice day silence shouldn't be broadcast in 1996. The idea that each station should aim at broadcasting to a fictional couple who are called Dave and Sue and are apparently the same in every single area of the country. The edict for 80% speech and 20% music we all had to follow. It was all complete and utter nonsense. Frank Gillard would have been disappointed in that, but he would have been delighted that all of those and other such stupid edicts have been redacted, if that's the right word. The powers that be are learning. And he would have been overjoyed at the many, many successes of his creation because his little experimental project in the 60s resulted in alchemy. From the apparent base metal of the so-called ordinary people came radio gold. And indeed, why wouldn't those at the centre want to try to bottle and then perhaps replicate that success? It's interesting that our very closeness to our community, to our listeners, defines how we broadcast. And whilst it's not the only way to make programmes, it does have a particular virtue in being able to find that authentic voice, not the expert, not the talking head. In America, there's a project called Story Corp, which is essentially is recording two and sometimes three people talking to each other about anything in their lives. BBC Radio 4 wanted to run with the idea, and you may have heard some of it. It's called The Listening Project. A slice of conversation, no agenda, no direction from us, the radio makers, with extracts broadcast on air and some stored in the British Library. Radio 4 knew that they could not, simply could not, access the public on their own. Theirs is a wonderful station, but it's not in touch with its audience in the way that we are. And so local radio work with Radio 4, BBC Radio Most I being one of the first stations in the pilot. We found people agreeing to talk to each other about love, life, loss, friendship, all the everyday eloquence of the voices around us. And the project continues. It is national and local radio working together in the best possible way. So here I am, essentially an actor who fell quite by accident into a glorious experiment. A man who spent years asking the listeners to ring me about what concerns them, playing devil's advocate or people's champion, sometimes translator, sometimes referee, sometimes all of the above in the same call. And behind me, a highly skilled producer, she was mentioned earlier by the VC, Angela Heslock, writing the scripts, organising the calls, feeding me information in my headphones, and most of all, shouting at me. It might seem like a solitary experience sitting in front of a microphone, but that really is the joy of the job. I'm actually never alone. I never know what's coming next. There's always someone to talk with, someone to argue with, to astound me with their ignorance, to humble me with their knowledge, and always at its heart, public service about and for the public. So I'd like, if I may, to tell you some of my personal highlights as the station has moved from offices in St. Thomas Street to purpose-built studios uh, in Paradise Street to our third home now in the heart of Liverpool One. And towards the end, I'll be playing you some of those highlights, skillfully assembled by someone else who was referred to today, our assistant editor, Pauline McAdam, whose literary skills have also helped me to hone this lecture. Hone means it was about five miles too long. We're down to a reasonable length, I hope you'll agree. I will remember the man who came from New Zealand, for instance, as one of my highlights last year, to pay his final homage at the Battle of the Atlantic Commemorations, which was held on the banks of the Mersey, and who wept when I asked him to share his story. I didn't know anyone would want to hear it, he said. Or well, the little girl who managed to sum up four exhausting days of our broadcasts when the giant puppets bestrode this city in 2012. You'll hear later, breathlessly summing up our assorted attempts at poetry with one glorious Liverpudlian hyperbole. She said, it was boss. And it was. I remember coming on air in April 89 as the horror of Hillsborough unfolded. I remember our engineers working to rig the service in the cathedral the following morning so that we could broadcast it. And 20 years later, sitting in the commentary position, 
as the anger erupted in Anfield Stadium during the annual memorial service, the anger that led to the formation of the Hillsborough Independent Panel, and back again at Liverpool Cathedral when the panel's findings were conveyed by the Prime Minister to a shocked and vindicated city. We have a serious and difficult job ahead of us as the inquests and the investigation unfold in the coming months, if not years. I remember how after the 1997 bomb scare at the Grand National, we became a sorting house for stranded racegoers as listeners offered a bed here, a room there. I remember 2008, albeit largely as a blur, we were everywhere. We were the only broadcast in the world to relay in full the opening and closing ceremonies and Paul McCartney's concert at Anfield. He wanted us to do it because we are BBC Radio Merseyside. I remember our engineers in the very best tradition of Blue Peter frequently keeping us on air armed with boundless enthusiasm and miles of sticky back plastic. When we began broadcasting rugby league, oh, we had nothing so grand as a press box. Our then engineer in chief, a wonderful guy called Bill Holt, fashioned us a press box from a shed that he bought. I'm told it served us very well until it fell foul of some rather windy weather. Imagine our approach now at Sochi or at Rio for the Olympics. I rather hope that in addition to all the satellite kit and the health and safety spreadsheets and the risk stuff and all the contingency planning, I really do hope there's still an engineer among the team who can say, what's the problem? Well, let's see what we can do with this shed. I love that audacity and I see it still. The idea of writing a poem for the city's 800th birthday by getting the listeners to do it for us the notion that they would be able and willing to take part in a series of abstract programmes about free thinking with BBC Radio 3. The fact that BBC Radio 3 came back again and again, even though at least two of their producers thought we were a scary bunch and had never been north before. Good for them. I love the sense of family with our listeners and with my colleagues. It probably isn't healthy or good for us to care as much as we do about what we do, but I wouldn't change it for the world. I love the callers who phone, and even the ones who won't hang up. I love the belligerent and beguiling and the downright gobby people who make up our station on both sides of the microphone. I wish that we could make more of those documentaries telling the stories of real people. I wish we could get out and into our patch more often to broadcast from where the listeners are. And I hate that we've had to cut our cloth increasingly carefully, that we're having to make do and mend when we want to be innovating and experimenting that we have to make programmes sometimes, and much too often for me, because of decisions made about us and for us by other parts of the BBC. But I love that the staff will not lie down, that they will work long hours to make sure that we continue to do these things, albeit perhaps on a smaller scale than they would like. In recent years, we've been bending our heads yet again as the scythe swung yet again. We've had to change our schedules to share programming with other stations, and we don't like it. We don't like being told what to do or when and how to do it. We may have a tendency to believe that we're always right, but at least we want the right to take our risks and make our mistakes if necessary, not somebody else's. Is that the right course? Who knows? Personally, I, I trust it more than a one-size-fits-all policy. That doesn't work for local radio. But it would seem I'm singing for once from the same hymn sheet as our Director General, our new Director General, Lord Hall. But let me remind you, on Radio Merseyside, we once had an extraordinary range of programming, a week weekly half-hour program for and produced by students. Steve Vos's Jazz Panorama, which ran for 35 years. Eric Hardy's Countryside, it ran from 1969 until his death in 2002. Sounds of, of Brass with Bob Dean. Jelly Collins' Junior Spin, right now and first heard at Artwaves. Another broadcasting giant, Bob Azurdi, produced a weekly interview programme, and Peter Small produced a weekly classical mu music programme. Excuse me, I need some more water. All those ones I've just mentioned have disappeared. But, happily, some survived from the earliest days. We have Folk Scene, the longest running folk music programme in the country presented by Stan Ambrose and Jeff Speed. They first broadcast that in 1968. They have never stopped since. Country music with Kenny Johnson. 60s music with Spencer Lee. Roger Hill's amazingly eclectic, pure musical sensations. And Dave Monk's weekly roundup of the rock scene. 
His programme has now become part of a wider BBC brand called BBC Introducing. A bad thing? Not necessarily. True, we've been told when we have to schedule a show for emerging musical talent, even if we know it's actually not the best time slot for it. But that wider BBC brand means similar programmes across the country can link up with important festivals such as Glastonbury and a wider audience through national partnerships. The programme and the radio stations are gateways to a wider world and that, I confess, has to be a good thing. So perhaps centralisation isn't all bad. The BBC is, after all, a significant brand. People want Radio Merseyside, but they want us because of, not in spite of, the BBC. But we must never, ever be seen as the poor relation, the easy option when times are hard and savings need to be made. Now, that lesson was learned by both senior management and the BBC Trust when the last DG but one, Mark Thompson, suggested, frankly, draconian cuts in local radio under the Orwellian title of Delivering Quality First. You'll know what we called it, Destroying Quality First. It was made quite clear to the powers that be that local stations belonged to the local community. The Vox Popularis raised the volume to a rallying cry. Petitions were signed. MPs raised questions in the House. Extraordinary letters were written in the Times, for goodness sake. And a posse of BBC Radio Merseyside listeners, armed with suitably worded banners, invaded Media City in Salford to confront Mr Thompson for an hour. And they got a result. The cuts were halved, and we're still here, kicking and fighting. Battered a little, bruised certainly, budgets leaner, but still breathing, still broadcasting, and with that new Director General. Local management have done their level best to mitigate the worst effect of the cuts, and as things constantly go around in circles in the BBC, I dare to venture that smiles will be put back on those management's faces in the future when we get back to a BBC that trusts its people and dares to devolve autonomy. I have huge hopes for Lord Hall of Birkenhead. Tony Hall, sometimes referred to cheerfully here as Scouse Tony, has already made huge strides in putting the smile back on my face, not least because when he came to visitors, he went away clearly inspired by what we do. He listened to staff, he listened to programmes, and he's referred to the power and the relevance of BBC local radio in several of his speeches to date. So despite what might appear to be doom and gloom, I'm actually genuinely optimistic for the BBC. I'm confident that throughout the corporation, there are many people with imagination, with talent, with ideas, who kept their heads well down, but retain those genuine BBC values I referred to earlier. Because while some of those bad things I've talked about were going on, the good has vastly outweighed them. And what is best about the BBC at a local level, the vast majority of managers, presenters, producers, broadcast assistants, receptionists, admin assistants, engineers, the workers at the grassroots, have just ignored the top management machinations as best we can, and we've just got on with the job. BBC Radio Merseyside's current manager, Sue Owen, sadly not well and can't be here today, joined us some two years ago. The first thing she said to staff was that she was there to protect us from, as she put it, BBC bollocks. Against the odds, she has done just that to the best of her ability. My optimism might seem odd as we come up to the charter negotiations, and the voices who want to diminish the BBC, to privatise it, to break it up, they will get louder and louder. Even David Dimbleby, of all people, was at it. It might seem odd after we just had the really ugly past two years. The Savile scandal, the McAlpine libel, the Newsnight chaos, the revelation that as well as the previous Director General George Entwistle's payoff of £450,000 after only 54 days in the job, Ten other executives received severance packages in recent years amounting to £4 million. The appearances before MPs, indeed the one most recent one yesterday before, they make for unedifying viewing. Clearly there were, perhaps still are, many who have forgotten they're working for a public service, that we are not a commercial business. But at heart, the crisis, and it has been a crisis, is about the way the BBC is managed about the layer upon layer upon layer of managers, far too detached from the daily outputs, some in conveniently ill-defined jobs, and virtually all on ridiculously high levels of pay. 
The good news, as I keep coming back to, is our new Director General, Tony Hall, is putting a stop to all of that. A major overhaul of BBC's management structure is in progress, and I'm certain will result in a clear out that is long overdue. Let me quote from a recent email he sent to all staff, quote, a simpler BBC, a more creative BBC. In April, he announced consultation on a cap of £150,000 for redundancy and severance payments. So he's doing all the right things, as well as saying them. It's a bit of a long quote, but I want to quote from one of his first speeches to staff, because it's why I believe we're in for a very good future. Quote, this is an organisation brimful with people who feel passionate about serving the public. I have talked, he said, with people who share my passion for this organisation, who are proud to say they work for the BBC, who are dedicated to the idea of public service broadcasting. No organisation as big as ours can avoid making mistakes, but I want to ensure that when we do make mistakes, they are caused by trying to serve our viewers and listeners, not by looking after ourselves. And when we do make mistakes, and we will, let's own up to them quickly, learn from them, and move on. When making a programme, I want us to think how great this could be if we got it right, not what will happen to me if I get it wrong. I don't want people, he said, to progress simply by stopping things happening and ticking boxes. I want everyone in BBC management to see it as a creative job, an enabling job, an inspiring job, helping people to give of their best. And how much I, for one, applauded his view that, and again I quote, a central part of my vision for the BBC is that it is not just paid for by its viewers and listeners, it belongs to them. I cheered again when he talked about the BBC being more aggressive and less British in putting its case forward as the Charter Review approaches. I love working for the BBC, whether it's drama, sport, news, current affairs, documentaries, the arts, music, national events, it is a great national broadcaster. Gillard created a great chain of local broadcasters, and BBC Radio Merseyside has always been amongst the best of them, not just in terms of its audience figures, more Merseyside has listened to us than to virtually all other BBC local radio stations and indeed radio stations in this area but it's the quality of our output. The whole thing is more of a triumph than Gillard could ever have imagined. And I know how proud he would be of a quote from a listener used in a BBC review into local radio in 2012. We have a wonderful, well-balanced radio station. They create a feeling of belonging to a community. They care about us, and we, in return, care about them. Their concern for their listeners is genuine and heartfelt. Radio Merseyside is at the heart of our community and in the hearts of its listeners. Now, it is perhaps inevitable that after so long with the Bieber, I look back with rose-tinted spectacles, and I do understand the baton must be handed on to the next generation of creative risk-takers and programme makers. But if those people back in the 60s and 70s were able to break free from central control, if they were able to take that given inch and turn it into a country mile, then who am I to lose faith in those people today who are to take BBC local radio to the century mark? I confess I don't understand how or why or even if local radio should have a footprint on the internet, in social media, all that Facebook stuff and all that. I'm as clueless about that as I am about football. And yet, I must allow that my suspicions may be wrong. If people want to email us or tweet us or or post on our Facebook page, just as they used to write in, who am I to gain say them? If the programmes we produce are now available on demand seven days a week on iPlayer, as opposed to being sedately repeated on a given Wednesday night, how can I call that anything but progress? I believe our new and emerging producers and managers are as passionate in their fight for the integrity of the product which they guard for the listener, as I've acknowledged those have in the past. Will they succeed? Will they be able to wade through the maze of compliance and centralisation? Will they be able to recapture again and again that spirit of trailblazing experimental pioneering when they have also to uphold what is now a heritage brand much loved by the listener? Well, I think so. They have the talent and the pride and the passion. And above all, I believe we have a Director General not only shares but will encourage their vision 
and in terms of local radio, will allow each station to grow and develop as part of the different community they serve. That, for me, is what local radio is about, and in local radio, the good vastly outweighs the bad and the ugly. Despite all the difficulties, all the changes, it is certainly at Radio Merseyside upholding those three words, inform, educate, entertain. And it's why I'm proud to work there and proud to be a small part of the BBC. And having told you why I'm proud and passionate about what we do, of our ability, as was recently said, to give voice to the beating heart of this, our community, it would be a nonsense if I didn't let you hear for yourselves. So for five minutes or so, I'd like you to listen, if I can get it to work, and I'm, we have engineers, thank God. Next Wednesday, BBC Local Radio comes to Liverpool and Merseyside. By Jove, just what we wanted. Radio Naughty Ash. It's touchy hilarious. It's full of plumptiousness, and I'm completely discomnockerated. This is BBC Radio Merseyside. It's a big security alert. Everybody is being moved away to the main viewing areas. Ah! Summerland is really a place now, it really is. Shevchenko from Milan, Shevchenko from Milan, and he's saved it! And Liverpool have won the European Cup! Out now by radio link to our reporting team. In the air, on the river and underground. I'm sorry, we can't go to uh, the beacon where Jerry Harrison should be, so on we go now to the second Mersey Tunnel. The police are moving back, the stone fires are moving forward. <laughs> I don't know, they're about three or four of them driving fast up the road. I would understand if there was some trouble. I just can't understand it. I think it is most appropriate. The gardens and exhibitions blooming on this site are symbolic of what we all wish for Liverpool. I'm telling you, you can't play politics with people's jobs and with people's services. Whatever Neil Kinnock says, that the Liverpool Labour Party will continue to fight to ensure that no one's sacked, that houses still are built and that no services are lost. The former Beatle, John Lennon, has been shot dead outside his home in New York. Good evening from me, Tony Nutter, and the flavour of the scene in Liverpool throughout this afternoon as fans of John Lennon gathered in their tens of thousands to pay tribute. It's been a bitterly cold and windy day here in Liverpool. is good it's semi-finals you've got a ticket to an fa cup semi-final you just you know you can't believe it you're following your team you're gonna win i remember stopping up at lady bar reservoir on the way a few drinks and some sandwiches everyone is a good mood if you take one of the passes over the panard you know though and, and shun the motorway it really makes a worthwhile experience coming here beautiful panoramic scenery which uh, as with today when the sun shines is almost unequaled in this country but I'll tell you something, that return journey will turn from heaven to hell for the Liverpool fans and players if they lose today. We realised that the people were actually dead because there was other people crying over them. Just to remind you, for those who are joining us, it's one o'clock, that the Debbie Cameron has absolutely vindicated the families. 164 police documents were amended. There were attempts to dig into the backgrounds of the dead, even children who died were tested for alcohol uh, and most significantly the Hillsborough panel report found that people could have been alive beyond the 315 cutoff and it does look like the Attorney General is going to be encouraged at the very least to quash the inquest verdict and indeed then to uh, institute a new... I sailed out of here in 1940, I went to sea when I was 14. <laughs> I ended up in Singapore under the Japanese and uh, I ended up in Changi jail. Many of my mates died. 
Well, clearly it's emotional for you. I'll speak to you in a minute. Just give you a moment to compose yourself as the Royal Party is currently uh, looking at the many memorials to the, the merchant seafarers that are here at Pier Head. What was the best bit? Um, well, I liked all of the dragons really and it was just amazing. And you know, this morning we were just watching where we met and, we were just, and this dog called Zolo just came over to us and we could pass him and his tongue was sticking out and his ears were flopping and everything. And the uncle and the girl had a big hug and she sat on the uncle's knee and they both fell asleep and it was just amazing experience, it was class. See, they're walking a long way, must be knackered over that. Am I glad to talk to you? Oh, that's nice, I'm glad to talk to you as well, Helen. I've been listening to you for a long time and I know that, I, I think, I, I'm on the same level as you, you know what I mean? Like with living in Liverpool and I think, I have to laugh when you say me mad and me dad, I do that. The UK's nomination to be Capital of Culture in 2008 is Liverpool. <laughs> in conjunction with Liverpool County Council... <laughs> BBC Radio Merseyside... <laughs> and Heatwave Sunbed Centre Norris Green... It's my duty to reveal that Britain has got talent, ladies and gentlemen. And his name is Sir Paul Mildred McCartney! Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming along here tonight to Anfield. In the city of Gotcha. The centre of the universe. Radio Merseyside. That's the stuff, boys. Ah, uh -huh. yeah, Hawks. Well, well, well. Radio, 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 radio. Merseyside. Well, that's the kind of adventurism and the quality and the enjoyment and the seriousness that I'm trying to encourage here at Liverpool Hope University, where I'm working with students such as those up there to create what's going to be the best student radio station in the country. And that, well, it was just a taster of what happens when you have the vision, the belief, the sheer foolhardy courage to broadcast the Vox Popularis. Long may the BBC continue to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Vice-Chancellor, Lord Mayor, distinguished guests and friends, this evening it's been a delight to welcome Professor Phillips to Liverpool Hope as our new Professor of Broadcast Journalism. As you can see, he's a hard act to follow. His lecture on the BBC, the good, the bad and the ugly, has been insightful, enlightening and passionate. He's also demonstrated his skills as a communicator and a radio broadcaster on Radio Merseyside for over 35 years where he informs, educates, and entertains audiences on a daily basis. It is, of course, his ability to listen, engage, and ask questions with the audience that's the test of any good broadcaster, as well as a good academic. As educators, we need to enchant, excite, and inspire our students. Professor Phillips brings with him the ability to do this, and he's already significantly enhancing the student experience in the media and communications department here at the university. As a university, it's always been our intention to seek out and recruit the very best scholars, as the Vice Chancellor has said. We go literally to the ends of the earth to bring in the very best academic talent to hope. Recent appointments include people from Colombia, the USA, Germany, France, and Italy, amongst others. In this instance, however, we've not had to go too far to find that very talent which is on our doorstep. So it's a great pleasure to acknowledge Professor Phillips' role in supporting the people of the city of Liverpool. We will forgive him his origins in Manchester, of course, as he's clearly adopted by the people of Liverpool. He understands the humour of Liverpudlians or Scousers, who's always had an ability to cope with adversity and understand the human condition. He gets it. 
After all, if you've driven a taxi and been an actor working for the Everyman Theatre, you will understand the people of Liverpool. And you'll also understand what's good and sometimes bad and occasionally ugly. He understands that local radio gives local citizens a voice and provides them with a means of being heard. This is no bad thing in times when there is considerable distrust of politicians and even some parts of the media. In his lecture tonight, he's highlighted to us how local radio was forged out of the BBC's proud tradition as a public broadcaster. And I think he's defended that very well for us. He's noted its mission as being to inform, educate, and indeed even entertain, moving from its traditional origins in 1922 to becoming a much less elitist and more representative organization. Indeed, the BBC has at times even challenged and poked fun at power and authority for its programming, as he's demonstrated tonight. In his lecture, he acknowledged the role of key individuals in that organization, Sir Hugh Green and Frank Gillard, who understood the power of radio and willing to make brave decisions. This is exemplified in local BBC radio, which has come to reflect the regional variations in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Radio Merseyside was founded as a result of such decisions in November 1967. It was the third and largest radio station in the UK. In looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly in the BBC, Professor Phillips has noted the challenges that the BBC has faced in recent years. These and challenges for the BBC local radio include trying to balance in programming priorities, public interest considerations, obviously financial concerns, and maintaining autonomy against potential centralism. The BBC, after all, whilst a public broadcaster, has also faced considerable challenges in the world around it, including, as Rogers highlighted, the use of social media. There is still, however, a very significant role for local radio. They provide the means by which local people, whether in cities or rural areas, are able to participate in local community affairs. As Rogers mentioned, Radio Merseyside has been at the heart of the city, listening, recording, and sharing with the people the city's triumphs and traumas. And it's evident in its coverage of the toxic riots, the horrors of Hillsborough, the city of culture and the recent arrival of the giant puppets in 2012. It helps people to identify and connect with their communities in ways otherwise might not be possible in the world we live in today. At a personal level, Roger records, I love that sense of family with the listeners and with my colleagues. I think that's an important statement. I love the sense of family with the listeners and with my colleagues. In looking at these challenges then, Roger, remains optimistic, suggesting that the good vastly outweighs the bad and the ugly. In that context, I'm sure Roger will work well with us at Liverpool Hope University, where we're very committed to the notion of the search for truth, beauty, and goodness, a key tenet of our university. At Liverpool Hope, we are delighted that Professor Phillips has agreed to become part of our university community. He brings to the university his expertise as a radio broadcaster and commentator. His commitment to supporting students on media and communications courses is already evident in the media and communications department. He gives up his time. He comes often from a busy day in the town, in the city, from a demanding schedule of work, including presenting his lunchtime radio show. And he comes here with enthusiasm, and he literally is passionate about what he does. In the last two years at Liverpool Hope, we've undertaken to make significant changes to our media program. Under the guidance of the head of department, Professor Michael McQueen, we've challenged the desire to chase new media technologies and practices. We've gone back to fundamentals and asked about how should we go about forming our students? What are Hope graduates? We want our students to be able to ask key questions and challenge prevailing wisdoms. We want our graduates in media and communication to be able to reflect on the profound social, moral, political, and economic questions that face modern societies today. It's then very good for our students to have Professor Phillips as a role model who raises similar questions on his show, challenging traditional models and approaches. In closing then, I once again welcome Professor Phillips to the university. I would also like to thank Roger's colleagues at the BBC Radio Merseyside who have worked with us 
on this appointment without whom we would not have been able to do this. I'd also like to thank you for coming tonight to mark this important event in the life of our university in the great city of Liverpool. Thank you. When uh, the conductor of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Liverpool Orchestra, gave his inaugural lecture, he chose to do it differently to giving a formal lecture. He got an ensemble, gave them a piece for the first time, rehearsed for 15 minutes in front of us, told them what he wanted emphasized and what he wanted toned down. Then he uh, told us about the piece, and then, finally, they performed for us. And so you got a sense of how the conductor works with his orchestra. And I got a bit of that tonight as um, an experienced and greatly loved uh, journalist on radio took us through this interesting history of this great uh, establishment, the BBC. Um, and then the insights that come to just understanding the dynamic history of um, this great British icon. For those of us who grew up in the colonies, the BBC World Service had the same impact because if you wanted to get some serious news outside the limitations of, say, an apartheid-governed South African Broadcasting Corporation, you tuned into BBC World Service to get a view of just, in fact, how the world was thinking. And, of course, coming to Liverpool, we discover very keenly what you see so clearly, uh, Roger, the vox popularis, the, 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 the importance of listening to the voice of the people. What an exciting evening. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, that as much as I did. It, and thank you, Dean, for your very insightful response. On these occasions, we often give our new professor a memento to remember the night, and we're going to do that again tonight. Thank you, Jackie. At least this immortalizes the title and the date, Roger. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming again. Good night.